go too crazy with the presentations. I just wanted to have a little bit for context and to, and to talk about what, for folks like, uh, I think my colleagues up here, but certainly for myself coming here and having a chance to sort of talk about a, a different angle on these things. I think in, in a lot of ways, you know, yesterday what really struck me, there's, we're all kind of facing the same problems, but the framing can be, can be very, very different. The challenges for some of the larger, more sort of hidebound companies, I think, you know, when, when you start at a, a place like National Geographic, where I've been not quite uh, three years now, everyone's heard of it, right? Everyone comes out of the woodwork, it's all super exciting, it's all super great, but when you, you sort of hear the stories, it's not, it actually has had periods of time where National Geographic was amazingly innovative. There was a, a period of time when, you know, they were the first folks to, or we were the first folks to put, you know, pictures in, in magazines, the first ones to do color photography, the first, you know, but those are innovations from quite some time ago. Uh, and that's not the story you get now. Our, our new CEO who joined um, shortly after I did, did a long listening tour, talked to customers, talked to parts of the business. And uh, I'm lucky enough to sit uh, just down the hall from him and, and we were just chatting the other day. And he, he said if he, one more person told him the story about the shelf full of magazines in the basement, he would punch them in the face. Uh, because it's a, it's a great story and people tell it to you because it's, you know, it's, it says how beloved the brand is and what it means and all that, and it's wonderful, but it's also about the past. And it's, it says, you know, it's all these things that are not really relevant in the future. And as we think about um, not just accelerating digital transformation in terms of moving faster, but, you know, I also think about it of accelerating the bandwidth. And the main reason I think about that is because of all the various things that National Geographic does today. So, you know, I'm sure we are all familiar with the magazine, but um, as a very mature company and in a period where the media space, the media platforms were fundamentally very mature. I mean, there was innovation in paper, there was innovation in printing costs, things like that. But ultimately, you know, you sort of expand to fill all the various ecological niches and, and it was a shelf space play. So National Geographic is uh, in some ways the world's smallest media conglomerate. Um, everything you can possibly imagine, a company the size and scale of a Disney does, National Geographic, a, a small nonprofit company in, in Washington, D.C., is trying to do. So we have our own book publisher. We have our own film studio. You may be familiar with the television channel that, that runs as a, a joint venture with, uh, with Fox and the magazines and what we're doing in digital. And all of these things, in some ways, you can think of as platforms. And these are all places where people come and they make a conscious choice. I'm going to interact with National Geographic, right? And there was a time you had your magazine, you sat down, and you, and you consciously read. And you know, there's mobile and disruption and all this, but the, the theme in a lot of ways is people aren't coming to you. It's not explicit choices. I mean, television is doing fine as a business today, but as we look forward, even, even there, you know, the death of linear or any of this, it's we have to find our customers wherever they might actually be. They're not going to choose to come to us. And dealing with all of these different businesses where all have their own little general managers and they all kind of have their own innovation ideas and trying to create an ensemble or an orchestra that, that these things can have complementary innovation and, and ways to move forward is very important. So our strategy in a lot of this, and what I'd love to talk about a little more, is trying to create a shared platform for these things. So it's not that top-down model of, hey, three or four guys in a star chamber have some paternalistic idea for the company, and it's go do this and go do that. But we have 28, 30 different business units, all of whom are incredibly small, but have ideas that should sort of hit the same beats and hit the same notes. And uh, this is really what we try to do to, you know, I can't necessarily make any one innovation exercise faster, but I can try to make them not step on each other and uh, allow for more of them simultaneously. So we try to create, and since I'm the technology guy, I'll talk a little bit about some of the systems, but we try to, you know, get really interested in thinking about our content and having a, a sort of taxonomy definition where if the people writing stuff are tagging it correctly, it allows us to put stuff together. All of which was, you know, um, uh, today we would describe as sort of our own mini knowledge graph, but we've been working on forever before it had kind of cool names and, and interesting ways to scale and do all that kind of stuff. Um, that allows us to generate all sorts of products automatically and do some interesting ways where we're not, you know, uh, to sort of one of yesterday's points, the big theme of, well, we're always talent acquiring, we're always hiring, and we're always looking for that. But, you know, I'm realistically not, I'm in a print media business. I'm, I'm probably not growing super fast anytime soon. So, you know, we need to find ways where the same folks who have this amazing talent can produce amazing products uh, as easily and find those 
you know, output channels as quickly as possible. We have our various tech systems for this, and I think in the interest of time, we'll just skip that. And uh, you know, I'd love to uh, talk some more about this stuff as it goes through, but uh, that was just a sort of framing on us. So. Thank you, thank you, Vince. Uh, and we're, going to, we're going to have an opportunity to actually make some uh, questions to, uh, to the group. Chris, do you, want, do you want to present something or do you have something? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, my name's Chris Hinton, and, uh, and I'm uh, part of a I'm part of Turner Broadcasting. Actually, we're not called Turner Broadcasting anymore. We changed our name yesterday, as it happens, while I was yeah. flying here. Um, so we're now just called Turner. So we're not a broadcasting company anymore, apparently. Um, uh, but, but my focus is uh, within CNN, which is one of our um, networks, which you may have heard of. Um, uh, the stuff that I do within CNN isn't really consumer-facing. And so what I wanted to talk about a bit was the challenges we have when, when all the focus is on, on consumer products and not on the internal systems that we use to, to develop content. Um, I'm sure that, oh, uh, I'll get this right in a sec, which one is it? Um, I'm sure that, that most people uh, are familiar with CNN and that it launched as a, uh, with obviously the youngest of you guys, because we launched in 1980 and 15 years later in, in 1995, we launched this wonderful website, which you know, we, really, we shouldn't have changed it, I think it was the epitome of design and remains so. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's 20 years since, since we launched this site, and, and it's incredible what's changed. And it's, uh, you know, back then it would have been impossible to imagine all the different delivery platforms that are now available to us um, and, and the ways that we can get content out to consumers. And, and this is just changing is so fast right now. Um, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of focus isn't put on the tools that we use to actually generate the content that ends up in these consumer tools. CNN itself um, uh, has a whole bunch of production systems that do lots of different things. Um, every day we, we have over 400 hours of video that we record and, and over 3,000 new video assets get edited by, by journalists and, and editors and, and then 200 hours of video gets put into our library which already has 800,000 hours of video in it, which is about 14 petabytes of data. And around the world, you know, from, from Hong Kong and London to uh, Los Angeles and, and Atlanta, New York and DC, people are producing shows. Um, and you know, over 4,000 people are interacting with tools that help them get their job done, but which consumers aren't actually seeing. So you know, we have uh, the, the, the challenge that many companies have that um, uh, as rapid innovations occurred, our internal development tools have kind of just grown organically. Um, they haven't been able to sort of ha have that, that same focus that people have on, on the delivery platforms that you see on your, you know, in your, on your mobile device. Um, instead, all these tools that people use to create uh, content get developed in a sort of a haphazard way. And at times, you know, we've, we've sort of struggled to keep up with all that technical innovation. So we sort of set ourselves a challenge a few years ago, and you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that we address this, um, to, to try to become more efficient and more responsive. Um, and, and we did that by, by thinking about four key areas. Uh, one of them was agility and the idea of you know, being able to respond quickly and, and, and you know, ag agile software development. The other was to think in terms of having a, a core platform that we could build upon and try to get people to not keep on doing the same things they do over and over again, but build upon you know, a set of core competencies. But probably more importantly were these two ideas of, of being able to get things in the hands of our, our users, those people who produce content as quickly as we can, and, and then keep changing those things as fast as possible. And um, I don't know if people are familiar um, with the idea of uh, the Lean Startup, but we tried to adopt the, the methodologies of the Lean Startup, uh, which is a book by Eric Ries. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, it, it talks about these three core concepts of um, the minimum viable product, you know, rapid iteration, and validated learning. And, and they're very simple. You know, the minimum viable product is the simplest thing that you can put in the hands of your customer that gives them some form of business value. And validated learning is the idea of questioning what it is the customer needs, coming up with a change, giving them that change, so that the, the change validates your assumptions about what's going to make their business better. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter, you know, because you can just change direction again. You pivot and do something different. But none of this works if you can't 
do all that very quickly and rapidly iterate. So we've been trying to put in place processes where we can get things in the hands of our customers quickly. And probably more importantly, um, processes that let us uh, um, deploy things and get things, um, make, thing, make, make those changes uh, in, in a very frequent basis. One of the things I was actually talking to Jonathan about yesterday is one of the things I've, I'm kind of most proud of is that we, we now are in a world where when we make a change, that change is in the hands of our customers the next day. So for us, we've got this idea that continuous delivery has to be continuous. So if somebody does something, they redesign an interface or they create a new tool, that thing is actually on people's desktops and available to them 11 a.m. the next morning. And we do that without all these approval steps and, and all these sort of asking customers when we might have a window to put things out there. It's an automated process. So I think that's really helped us, and it's helped us focus on being able to deliver the, 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 the things we have to do internally in producing content so that we can actually innovate in producing all those uh, tools and things that, and, and applications we need to have out there you know, in, in, the, in the rapidly changing consumer world. So it's, I could talk about this forever, but, uh, but I won't. I'll let you yeah, move absolutely. on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Chris. I'm going, to, I'm going to embrace the principle of um, talking uh, without a presentation and just give you some perspective on this little old company called Technicolor. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of nice to be an old company and, and with maturity and age comes, you know, with, I think there's a saying that says that uh, experience is the comb that life gives you when you've lost all your hair. And uh, I've certainly fulfilled, fulfilled that ambition in the last part. And basically, um, the story of Technicolor is, is a story of, of if you're going to be a company that's going to survive being the dinosaur at 40 years old, um, you have to change. You have to adapt. A 100-year-old company like Technicolor starts as a startup. Uh, and we were a startup 100 years ago, 1915. If you think about that era, uh, Einstein had not yet posed or was in the process of posing the theory of relativity. A telephone call between San Francisco and New York took place for the first time ever. In other words, we did not have long-term commu long, long distance communications, and yet here was a small group of people in Boston decided that they'd seen some movies, they thought they were pretty excited by the experience, and they wanted to bring colour to the black and white experience. And remember back in those days, people saw a train coming towards them on a screen and ran out of the theatre because they were worried they were about to get run over by a train. <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is pretty visionary stuff. A hundred years later, here we are, a different company, and one of the things I would, would, uh, would like to, to uh, espouse here is the importance of change. Uh, we took this company, or I should explain that about uh, 2009, we took the company through a Chapter 11 to restructure it. Um, that we came on board, the CEO and I came on board, because essentially uh, the company tried to do too much, got a little bit too um, bloated, a little bit too many things going on, something like 54 acquisitions over the space of about five years, didn't integrate any of them, and it was losing money. In fact, hadn't made money for about 15 years. So uh, we came on board, took it through Chapter 11, and that's when you get focused. <laughs> that's when you understand you just to innovate, you have to survive. Um, so the first thing is survival, Laszlo's Pyramid, all those sort of things. But, but at the fundamental core of being able to survive and change, if you want to survive and go, continue to thrive, is recognising that if you're a technology company, if you're in this business of today, all this disruption, all those things changing in our industry, you have to re maintain and grow and leverage as much innovation and change in yourself uh, to adapt to that world out there. So, um, so yes, one, some very important element of what we did in that first couple of years was survive and create what I would call good business practice, operational excellence. When you build or make 1.4 billion DVDs every year, um, a cent in a dollar makes a big difference to your profitability. So you do everything you can to be operationally excellent. Um, but, but at the core of what we were as a company uh, was, the, was a, a, a technology company. Lots of researchers, probably the largest research organisation dedicated to media entertainment in the world. So we've got some very creative people, but focusing them on the right things in a world when Probably for the last 10 years, we, as a company, we had decided we were trying to make the most out of what we had. You know, how do you just get that little bit more um, margin? How do you make DVDs last a few years longer? Um, we came on board and said, well, DVDs are going to go away, um, so we better have a business that survives beyond that. And, and when we looked inside the company, we realised that too many people were focused on sustaining today rather than necessarily growing the, the future. So, um, f firstly, I'd have to say that in a framework of creating that sort of innovation inside the company, you've got to have the talent. 
So from the bottom up, if you don't have the people in the organisation that can really embrace change, that, that can't, can't um, see the world a different way uh, and want to make that possible, if you don't have the passion for the industry they're working in, then it's going to be hard. Um, fortunately, we, we had a very talented company. That was not the problem. We had lots of creativity. We had lots of good ideas in the company, but getting them to market was the challenge. So um, having said that, that's the second element that we needed, which was, OK, let's, from the top down, create the basis by which the company can innovate, that we can capture all these great ideas. Some of them will be terrible. <laughs> some of them will be good. <laughs> and fortunately, some, enough of them have been good. Um, we, we've certainly tried to adapt our innovation system across the company uh, to, to use what we think are the core capabilities of our, our business and what we have as talent and uh, give them a framework that makes sense. Very simply, that is that forget who our direct customer is, direct to, forget who our client is. If we're, not cons if we're not focused on the end consumer, the end consumer experience, if we're not understanding how someone who picks up a story and reads it or watches it or listens to it isn't excited by that story, then we'll have failed. Whether they watch it on the TV, whether they watch it in the cinema, however they get excited by the story and that experience, then it's not going to be relevant. We're not going to make money in the end. So that, that vision has pervaded everything we do. And it, it's, it certainly still translates to the way we work with our studio customers, with the consumer electronics companies or service providers we work with, but we're focused on end user experience. But sometimes we're not the best company to do that innovation. And then we need to sit inside an ecosystem that, that, you know, that um, but basically allows us to make sure those innovations reach the customer. A um, hundred years ago, uh, we worked with a startup in animation that, that was really struggling, had gone bankrupt once. Uh, they were really struggling to define their experience as the consumer, and they wanted colour and animation. So Walt Disney and Technicolor formed a strategic partnership, and we brought colour to animation. And that was a pretty exciting time. I mean, Disney made all the money, by the way. <laughs> Technicolor certainly, certainly benefited from the success of colour and animation. But, uh, but it was an important lesson, which we, con you know, we consider to be still relevant today, is, is take advantage of the ecosystem that you're in, work with your partners to bring that innovation to market. Today, we have a number of examples of where we've, we've started an innovation, but decided that the best way to bring that to market was to work with a partner and have the partner bring that to market. We set up a, a venture ecosystem where a lot of the ideas that we've had, we've spun off as startups because it, was be, it would be easier for a company that's starting up, recruiting the talent that's relevant in today's market to take that innovation rather than a 100-year-old company, and as, as nimble as we'd like to be, um, we're not going to run at a startup space. So um, if you're competing against startups, if that's the environment that that technology and innovation is going to work, it's probably not best if we take it to market. We just find a startup that can take it to market better. So the framework um, that I tend to think of is make sure the talent's there, make sure we, we, we're constantly bringing in the right people. Uh, secondly, let's put a, 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 an overall positioning of the company top down that allows the right innovation to occur in the right places, provide the vision, um, give, give all of the tools that are necessary for the, for the business to be successful, but, um, but make sure that, uh, that you then work within the ecosystem uh, to uh, create the outcomes uh, in the environment that you need. We've got a couple of examples of, of stories that, that, that really work for this. Um, but probably the one I'm most proud of is uh, what we call today our production services business. The history of Technicolor has been that when you go to the movies, you see a, you see a, a picture up there on the screen, and, and more than likely, 90% of the time, Technicolor has had something to do with that movie. Uh, if it's a blockbuster, probably. A, Certainly, Age of Ultron, <laughs> you'd have no, no problem with. Um, but uh, when we came on board, that was clearly moving away from film to, uh, to the idea of digital production. The number of visual effects that was in a, in a, in a, in a, a movie was probably 10, 15 shots, and now it's about 2,000. The, the visual effects business inside Technicolor was less than $30 million uh, a year at that point. And if you went by the spreadsheet, if you went by the um, can you succeed, all of the stuff that you might learn in Harvard Business School, you'd probably kill that business. But we decided that actually it represented totally all of the vision that we wanted. You know, it was about consumer experience, about creativity, about telling stories. And it actually leveraged our skills, which was the sophistication of modeling images and, and creating a, a visual experience. Today, that business is more than 10 times larger. We're the largest provider of visual effects in the world. We've won our first Academy Award. Um, and we're probably, you know, today, 
leading the, 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 at the leading edge of what you do in visual effects, taking forward um, virtual reality, augmented reality type technologies into market and working with partners to make that experience work. So it's a great story for us and it was about persistence, innovating, um, creating, creating the right sort of um, framework for a company that's 100 years old, near death, and to take it to the point now where, uh, by the, at least by the measures that we, we count on, uh, is, is probably set up for success for the future. Well, thank Thanks. you, Vince. That's a good start. And uh, so, yes, I was going to say, that reminded me of, uh, I travel a lot in airlines, so that reminded that somebody got the middle seat there. In, <laughs> and the, mi the mean temperature was the same. Uh, 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 <laughs> The, um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Vince. That's a great story. I think that the uh, we talked about a little bit about the, uh, the importance of content, you know, for for some of these companies, and uh, and I heard the petabytes and uh, of the, that are common probably to CNN, Turner, and uh, National Geographic. And uh, Jonathan, meaning, I'd like to ask you: Do you understand the digital journeys or the journeys that your customers have to go through? Do you know? We talked about what you have. Do you understand the, the needs of the customers today? Well, uh, we certainly try. Um, there's a certain amount of humility I think you have to take on this, which is, especially when you have a global brand. You know, I, I've been there um, set down for three years, and one of the first learnings was, so National Geographic does uh, gangbusters business on social networks. It's huge on Facebook. I think it's one of the, if not the largest, one of the largest Instagram. Uh, uh, communities out Thanks. there, but when you look at the global, oh, you spoke up, all right. There we go. Um, is that better? Yeah, when you look at the, the global reach, uh, you realize actually that 80% of those folks are coming from outside the United States. And the majority of those folks are coming in countries that don't really have, or aren't known for particularly good English. Uh, and yet they're coming in, and interacting with the brand in ways that you know, we sort of look at it and say, well, why is, you know, why is uh, Cairo one of our largest cities uh, for folks to come in and, and go? Now, there's historical and there's some, some topical alignment there, but you certainly have to approach, uh, and, and it's one of the very first things I think anybody drills into anyone in, in business is you are not the customer, right? And, and, you know, in the early days of digital, as you're doing this, you were the customer because, you know, you're sort of playing around with this stuff and then, you know, I suspect most of us who were doing internet things at that time were some of the first folks to jump on mobile or jump on the internet. So we were constantly telling everybody what it was. And that ship has sailed a long time ago. And now we're becoming more of the get off my lawn, you know, sort of uh, uh, reaction. Of, I don't understand what, you know, my daughter's on Snapchat all the time and I, okay. And more people come to National Geographic through Snapchat than come to nationalgeographic.com. Uh, and so we have to just approach that with a, okay, we've got to find them where they are. And it's a constant, constant source of um, attention. And if you sort of take your eye off that ball, uh, you'll, you'll lose it without, without realizing it at all. Yeah, yeah. And I believe this is connected to uh, some of the points that we discussed yesterday, you know, about we have a community of users that are technology voracious, and they can move and adapt and, uh, and switch from one technology area to another very, very quickly. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, for, uh, Chris, I mean, the, uh, we were talking yesterday about the, uh, the, the control center, you know, when you, the pre-production, I mean, uh, when you, be the, the, when, uh, when you, with all the employees and the people that make it happen behind the curtains, I mean, uh, the teams that, uh, that are developing solutions, that are implementing solutions, I meaning are those teams uh, are using a cross-functional approach, I meaning do you have what is required today? I mean, are they prepared? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure. Is this on? I guess. Yeah. Okay, I, I guess, uh, um, they, I, I'm not sure they used to be. Uh, I, I think that, that, like I said earlier, you know, we, we've, we, we often allow those internal systems that we use to produce content to just grow organically without any real thought and planning around them, um, and, and without really giving them the resources that they need. I think that what we realized you know, not that long ago in the last few years was that we have to keep building more and more products that, um, that consumers use that, that sort of are seamless and transitional. So you know, um, you know, if, you, if, you get, 
if you get a, a breaking news alert on, on, your, on, your, on your Apple Watch that you can then go and read about it on your iPad and you can go and interact with it and watch stuff on, on, a, on a television somewhere or on, on your iPhone or, you know, that, that you've got to be able to interact with that content everywhere. Um, I think what we then had to try and figure out is how do we build the tools internally that can allow us to get content out to all those devices. So I'm not sure that we were prepared for it. I think now we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to sort of put together a, an internal platform upon which we can build new tools really quickly. So when somebody comes along uh, and, and says to us now, well, we've got to be able to deliver this extra bit of content. It's not just like a new story, but we want to, we want to dig into what's actually happening in the control room. Um, you know, what, 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 what are the people who are producing the stuff in the show teams? What are they, um, you know, what, what other content could they be providing out to people which you just don't get when you just watch a linear broadcast? Um, we need to be able to dig in and get that information out for them. In fact, we've got a good example. There's an application called, um, a, a consumer application called CNN Go, which we launched a year ago, which um, you can get on your iPad or desktop, and it's, it's really going to be our main platform for, for cross-device. Um, one of the general ideas behind it was that it wasn't just watching the news. It wasn't just like a, a, a linear video feed. We dug into all of the other places where content exists like inside the control room where they're constantly making decisions about which segment should we do next, you know, did that, you know, uh, what, what's actually happening in the news, so we're shifting things around all the time, changing the orders of things. That's really kind of interesting information that people are interested in, or some people are, and so we pulled that information out and embedded it into the tools. So when you watch CNN via the CNN Go tool, you're actually getting to see everything that's happening in the control room, you get to see the rundown, and you get to see all that extra stuff that the show teams are thinking about um, that they can't necessarily get on air, but which is useful background. So I, I think we're doing better, but it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Vince, I think that the, uh, you brought a, a couple of good, interesting points. Meaning we some, many times in, the, in these conversations, we talk about agile development, agile delivery, and uh, agile something. Very, very few things I hear about agile funding, right? And uh, going back to some of the points that uh, Lisa made today, you know, corporate, when you are in a traditional corporation, budget becomes a roadblock, becomes well but, cost a lot of money, then suddenly you, have, you go into a cycle of uh, having to justify that hockey stick and the spreadsheets and the PowerPoints to go alongside that. And that, in, a, in, a, in essence, represents the hesitance of the leadership of companies to actually do the investment. And when I compare that to, for instance, the venture capital world, that I would, it seems to me that would be the agile funding approach. They are not going, they're going for metrics that are, because they're not profitable. Those companies are not profitable. You're investing on something where you have to make much quicker decisions on board meetings, if you're going to either shut it down or fund it in, enough and more to go to the next stage, okay? So how, how do we fund inside the corporation? Or what do you think uh, you can do it within a corporation to have a, a similar approach that get this innovation pace going within the corporation. You explain, yeah, I think that that's good, the strategy is to say, okay, I'm investing in some uh, startups. How do you do it within? How do you tie budget to results that are not necessarily the ones that are used to uh, in, in, uh, in the traditional environment? That's a, that's a very good question in the context of a, a company that, um, you know, we had creditors uh, that they wanted us to pay back our debt. Yeah. So they, you know, it, it, if you if you if you came out and said, oh, by the way, we're investing ten million dollars in this startup, they'd go, what? <laughs> Why don't you pay us? Um, so uh, we had to be very careful about uh, making sure that all the stakeholders, not just the internal ones, understood. Look, you know, we're a technology company. We need to invest in the future, and the returns aren't always in the next twelve months. Um, so the the difference here is between competitive strategy and portfolio strategy, uh, and and uh, I would say that. Um, it's, it's easy uh, when you're, you're looking in the context of competitive strategy inside an existing business, and, you, and I shouldn't say it's easy because there's plenty of examples where it doesn't work, but that, you know, when, you, when you're looking at your business, your customers, your marketplace, your competitors, 
um, what you're doing in your business. You're looking at the elements of investment into, put, into your competitive differentiation and what you require to be successful in the marketplace. And that's constantly changing. A lot, lot, lot of, lot of, um, lot of books and things you can read and, and lessons you can take from that. And uh, it's important to make decisions on return of investment uh, and understandings of, of what's going to work and make decisions about turning things off within that context. But portfolio strategy is a lot different. And um, when we have businesses that are in various ages of, of growth and decline, um, you know that the rate of innovation of success, that if you start 10 things, nine of them are probably not going to be as successful as you'd like them to be and one is going to be successful. Um, we, that's the way we think as an innovation company is that we're just going to keep trying. It's not throwing mud against the wall, you know, things against the wall and seeing what sticks, but it, it, you're obviously trying to make educated guesses. I always make the analogy to a, a basketball player. Um, you know, they keep shooting. <laughs> you want them to keep shooting. Uh, they want every shot to go in. They think it's going to go in, but it doesn't necessarily go in. Um, you know, a good, a, good, a good hit rate is probably 30%, 35%. Um, so uh, in our case, uh, clearly, you know, you're trying to make sure that uh, when you've made a decision, you believe in that, you, you believe that's going to be successful, you put the right team on it, but you give them milestones and objectives associated with showing progress. Um, and you manage the portfolio of different things uh, in the different areas that you're trying to innovate and be successful. Um, I, you know, I won't get into the detail of how much you spend. It's, you know, it all depends on your budget. You know, if you're a bigger company, you spend more. Uh, if you're Google, you spend $300 million on Magic Leap. Um, we didn't make $300 million investments, just if there's an accreditor in the room. Um, but, um, but we certainly uh, apply the principles, like a venture capital company, you know, it's just that in our case, some of those venture, increasingly, not just making those investments internally, we looked externally. And, uh, and you know, we, we set up a team to do some of that. Mm -hmm. Now, in general, do you think that that's an area that is all figured out for uh, actually enabling those digital disruptors from within? Uh, or it's something that actually still work under progress? Oh, it's definitely work in progress. I mean, we've got successes. It, it, we, when we compare ourselves to our peers in the different segments we compete in, we know we're a more innovative company. And, and being num we try to be number one or number two in all the markets we're in. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a little GE thing that so tends to work um, when you've got a lot of businesses. And uh, it certainly helps uh, that if you think you can help make a business, uh, you think you can do something that will change the nature. And when we work in Hollywood, generally speaking, uh, you know, it's easier, I won't say, easy because it's never easy uh, to, to convince people to do what you want them to do but you can bring a technology to market more effectively uh, when you have the relationships and the, and the position in the, in the market uh, value chain um, in the areas where it's completely new of course we have no right to play more than anyone else uh, and so virtual reality there's a lot of the things that we you know we we do that we think are really relevant and um, we can see what will be successful in telling a story you know for those of you who haven't sort of played with virtual reality too much it, the, tradi the tradition of storytelling is, okay, um, when we were all cavemen sitting around a fireplace, uh, we'd tell stories by communicating to the people around the, around the fireplace. And, and if I was talking to you, I would be able to give the story more by what you react to, and I, I could give it a little bit differently to you, and I could tailor the story according to what was going on. That's the way storytelling started. Then we started drawing them on cave walls, and then we started to we created this thing called a printing press. And what, what happens with the printing press is that it goes, well, there's only one way to tell a story, and that's in this linear format. You've got to go from the start to the end. Storytellers, for the last hundreds of years, have basically said, I've got to tell the story the way the medium allows me to tell it. And um, that it's the whole industry set up that way, whether you're a producer, a director, whatever. You want to tell the story the way you learnt to do it. Um, and uh, in virtual reality, that's just not true anymore. You know, I can now put a headset on and I can, I, I, I have to, I can, navigate my way through that story. That means the whole industry has to learn a new way to tell stories. How do I, how do I, how do I get the person with that headset on to go to where I want them to see the story and create visual experiences that work and, and all that sort of stuff and, and make it meaningful for them? And, and so we have a lot of ideas on that. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of um, experience on making technologies work and, and we're working with partners to try and do that. So. Um, but can I tell you it'll be successful? No, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I would like to open uh, for questions from the audience. I have a few more questions, but you guys feel free to, uh, to ask any questions to, to the panelists. And are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Companies 
sponsoring to people around the world. So the the, the, the way of including things is more like uh, the things that I'm used to, but leaving out things, uh, synthesizing, that is like a, a key question that I have, especially in large corporations. Um, well, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's an important insight and, and way to look at things. Uh, and I think it works on a lot of dimensions. I'm certainly not going to uh, try and tell anyone in this room about design or anything. But you know, when you get to content and storytelling, certainly uh, we've all had the experience with how much a good editor and and you know the choices you make are probably more about what you leave out than what you include. Uh, and the the you know the analogies of the people you know you write the long letter because you don't have time to make it short or you know other things like that where. It's very easy to create, especially in this world, it's very easy with the bulk content tools we have to do what some people might call shovelware or other things. It's you know, creating a bunch of pages for some simple SEO strategy is an easy thing to do. But it's not a use, one, it's not the business I think that a lot of us want to be in, but it's also not, it's not long-term sustainable one little Google algorithm tweak and your whole, your whole business evaporates. But I think it's also important not just on the sort of artistic and creative side, but to think about it from business side as well, where sort of Vince's earlier point about you know the portfolio management and managing these investments, at least in my experience in, in large companies, uh, the biggest danger, I see everyone, everyone wants to be innovative, but in a lot of cases, you're blinded by your current successes. So you, you work on these projects, and I've been involved in some miserable, miserable failures, where the idea was a pretty good idea, but, we, but it got built up to this unreasonable expectation that it was going to save the world or cure cancer or make $100 million in the first three years because that was the, if it didn't hit that kind of number, it wasn't interesting to the board and they wouldn't even care. So you would kind of gin up the, the, the thing and try to make it more than what the idea really was. And of course, the, the companies that are successful, the very, very successful companies were rarely uh, envisioned on day one that they would grow to the sizes and the and the products and the successes that they've had is you know it's more of a planting a lot of seeds analogy and being you know, maybe a little ruthless and and uh, working with um, you know understanding what is growing and, and what isn't but again having that that tight lens whether it's on your business scope or, or your actual artistic creative endeavor I think is tremendously important uh, especially for an existing entity that doesn't have sort of the luxury of, well, we'll all just sort of dissolve and create a new company and, and, and try again. I mean, it's certainly possible that National Geographic and Technicolor and CNN are all great brands, but uh, they could be gone in 20 years, any of them. Uh, and so there's a different response. I, I don't know if it's true, but I, I feel a different responsibility where I would like my grandchildren to have National Geographic be an important company that's around at the time that I might not think so if I was, you know, shopping my underwear.com or something like that. That, you know, it comes, it goes, it gets bought, it gets sold, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's good. Well, I mean, actually, I was, I was going to, I was thinking as you were saying that, I was thinking of, of the, the, what I was talking about with this whole idea of, of uh, the minimum viable product and actually trying to get things uh, um, out there that, that aren't bloated. We've got a slightly common background because uh, Jonathan actually used to work at Turner as well and I know what he's talking about when he talks about <laughs> products where we, we um, you know, an idea was had and, and we couldn't release it until all the bells and whistles were on it, all the things that, um, that, the, that the designers and the, and, the, and the people behind it thought that it had to do. And, and I remember we built uh, a product, I'm not going to mention it, but we built a product uh, you know, some years ago um, which would have probably been a great idea if we hadn't spent two years building it at the scale that, that, that CNN was at, right? Even though it was probably going to get about a hundredth of the audience. Um, and that's really what comes back to this idea of, of building just the bare minimum that actually gives you some value mm -hmm. and then trying to iterate that and, and, and iterating it so it goes in the direction that's, that, that continues to add value. Um, uh, so we've tried to embrace that, but... Uh, I think so many people don't, and, and, and you know, we don't succeed all the time either. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, had a, I had a question for uh, Jonathan. Um, I, I met a, a writer who did an assignment for National Geographic, and it was pretty unusual because it was driven by the photographer, which is, you know, kind of like complete reverse. And what I was wondering about is, Well, 
Well, I, I mean, that's true. And it is absolutely an imagery, photography, visual, you know, we, we, we often use the term visual storytelling. Uh, we certainly have textual products and things like that, maps, you know, things like that. But uh, photography is our bread and butter, right? And in some ways, you know, people sort of sit around and go, well, you know, gosh, why, why weren't we Instagram or something like that? That, uh, you know, well, okay, great, but we're not. So we, you know, we can go do, we can go do other things. Um, but it, it really does, um, you know, create that corporate culture and that corporate DNA. And there's, you know, we have our, we have our mission statements and our values about, you know, inspiring people to care about the planet, and this and that, all of which I believe in. But then there's this sort of bedrock DNA of, of what, you know, where the, where they, uh, where the true value of the, the company is and sort of from a, the, you know, a CNN might be about immediacy and, and, and accuracy. You know, National Geographic is about the richness and, and depth of the photography. And it can be good and bad. I mean, the, 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 the lore, there was a time there where National Geographic was making money hand over fist. Um, they, were, they would try things with very little, uh, you know, they're, they're putting photography and magazine, color photography in a print product at the time that they started doing. It was fantastically expensive, but they just, eh, what the heck, it, it felt right to somebody, they did it, and it was tremendously successful. And there was this culture which had a negative side, wonderful artistic freedom, which was, hey, you're a National Geographic photographer. Why don't you go down and try to get some really good jungle pictures? Here's an assignment. Come back in about three months and let me know what you have. And literally, like, that would be the assignment. Someone would get a contract and they'd have, they'd be made, you know, decent money for 1930 to go do that. And, you know, that's great, but that, that, that's not who we are anymore. And, and we do certainly send people to go, you know, sit in the mud and try and get an insect for... For, uh, for three weeks or four weeks, but, but you know, we have to be more structured in our kind of innovation and, and, and do that. But it, it sort of speaks to the DN corporate DNA, I guess. Yes. Can I? Yep. Yeah, yeah, um, hi, uh, my name is Lucia Godinayu. I'm um, an independent consultant. Uh, I do a lot of um, projects on um, uh, transformation to digital. Um, I also work um, with big companies, vendors, uh, system integrators who are involved in this. And my focus for the past uh, probably 15 years was um, communication, media, and entertainment companies. Um, I, I have been um, involved into this business strategy uh, and uh, portfolio um, build up uh, so that innovation is included into. And the problem that um, I'm tackling um, is um, the financial aspect. And here I, I uh, heard the return on investment, um, which is very, uh, um, it's a common term and, and it has different representations, whether it's in the corporate uh, or it's in the VC area. And um, through multiple projects and, and experiences and, and uh, groups involved, um, I arrived to the conclusion that there is something in the middle. Um, I called it, it's a grassroots, um, it's specific to maybe communication service provider uh, environment. And we call it digital services innovation through rational experimentation. And uh, basically, question? the question is uh, how to calculate this ROI when you lack a common platform that will give you immediate feedback on the step that you take into the unknown, any project that you So um, I, I think it comes a little bit to the, you know, your idea of rational experimentation is certainly completely true. I, I, my point before about um, existing businesses, you can use more traditional measures, to, but, but when it's new businesses, you can't. Um, we, we, we have a, a rule internally that we don't make any decisions around a PowerPoint. Uh, around anything to do with new businesses. Um, that doesn't mean we don't have data. It doesn't mean we don't take on board all of the other things, market studies, all the things you need to have. But no decision meeting, if you haven't read the material before you come to the meeting, leave the meeting. So you come to the meeting, we talk about it, and we, we work our way through what we believe, um, what our convictions are, because at the end of the day, we're going to get judged on what decisions we make. 
So if we're the right people in the room and we're using our experience and our understanding of the market because we're in the market, uh, we can make decisions based on the information we have. I, I can get computers and university students to do work if, you know, if, or, or high school students if all we're going to do is just make mechanical decisions from meeting a certain return on investment calculation for these sorts of big decisions. So it is about the management team and the people involved and the decision makers to have be armed with the right information, and make judgments on their experiences and, uh, and what they feel, you know, what they believe, that, that's like convictions. Um, that, so the framework we have, we try to create, okay, what, what's important to us? You know, what are the measures of success that, that matter that aren't necessarily financial, that are about market entry or proof points? And if the, if the business is meeting the things that we think are important, and, and as long as it's not costing too much, um, then that's fine. Uh, you know, that's the way we prefer to, to think about it. And it's all just data. It's okay to fail. That's the other thing is that we, we try to, it's difficult because people don't like to fail and everyone feels like a failure is, you know, the, this heart, heartfelt blow. But a failure is a great data point in understanding and um, you know, understanding when is the right time that this, this failure, if that's what it is, is the data point that I need and okay, now I can move on and make a new decision uh, is, is, is sometimes tough for the teams but it's the right thing to do. Thank you, Vince. Well, one more, last question. Oh, you get one extra man. <laughs> so you guys all work on uh, work at global companies uh, with distributed teams. I'd be curious to hear what the challenges are for driving innovation with people working around the world. And kind of follow on to that is, is it easier or harder here in three different uh, cities around the US uh, to drive innovation in the place where you are Uh, I think we can all take this on a, on a pretty short level. Um, you're right. The, the, having distributed teams is tremendously difficult uh, in a lot of ways. And one of the largest or one of the easiest is almost all the literature, you go to an agile dev conference, it's getting a little better now. But you know, the model would often be for really shaped around startup teams. You know, everyone sits around, eats a, you know, the, the two pizza team or you know, it, it, the concepts of uh, the, the Agile and Scrum, which is a very common development methodology, and I, I believe in it, but it's very good at sort of breaking down barriers within that team. And of course, as any other organizational structure does, it puts up barriers between that team and people who aren't on the team. And when you reach a certain scale, you can't, you just can't get everybody into one team or your team becomes an, an unwieldy size. And there are a lot of, there's no real easy answer on how to kind of orchestrate across those different things. So when we work with a, an offshore or remote partner, um, you know, we can say, fine, you have, an, a, you have a, a coherent team all in, in your particular city, but then it still has to fit into some kind of larger framework. There's no, no, no one team can be empowered to do every possible thing they might ever need to do, right? So that's a constant source of worry. And, you, you know, you worry about time zones. You can do some things with, uh, you can do some things with video conferencing and things like that, but ultimately, you know, it's face-to-face. -face, it's we're keeping the airlines in business. It's all... You know, it's all that kind of stuff, but um, someone had a magic solution to that, then uh, I'd love to hear it, but, but we work, with, we work yeah. with that quite a bit. Yeah, definitely uh, empowerment of those teams uh, becomes essential. So, oh, my, question, my question was, um, you know, um, you mentioned something around the reinvention that the industry needs to, needs to uh, make given that now we have virtual reality and before we were used to storytelling in a, in a linear way, and now we have you know, the point that the user can go everywhere. Um, that's similar to what we said yesterday, saying you know, we need to extend the word content now to digital experiences that are you know, totally different from you know, storytelling and goes more into uh, story doing or story building, you know, um, how your three companies, I mean, are being prepared or are thinking about this new reality of this extension of the word content into this uh, new digital experience that is content that is at the same time is competing for the airtime of the, of the same users you are targeting? I'll start because I start, I, I created that problem. So <laughs> no, um, the, um, we, you know, we do def definitely feel that there's a golden age uh, of, of content creation right now, and it's, it's really exciting because 
think storytelling has always been open to anyone who wants to tell a story, but the tools to be able to reach large audiences are, are more instantly available, and it's changing everything about the way the business models of the industry work. Uh, and so that's an opportunity as well as a threat. <laughs> and there's definitely um, lots of, uh, when I say threat, it's for everyone. Like it's uh, for everyone who's traditionally got the business models that work uh, from creating big, expensive content and distributing it over television. We now have to, all have to think, well, actually, you know, a story could be told anyway, um, or people can be entertained in, in the limited 24 hours a day that we have to be to doing things. Um, you're going to consume it somehow or another, and little snaps of, of, of short stories are, uh, are, are exciting and get, get people's attention. So um, from our perspective, uh, I, I think you've got to be able to embrace uh, the world the way it is, not the way you'd like it to be. So you've certainly got to see it and, and understand where the opportunities are uh, to bring what you think is your capabilities. In our case, um, enabling a storyteller to reach their audience uh, is, is something we, we continue to have a, a mantra uh, of, of what we want to do. Lots of opportunity, lots of technology. It's, it all comes down to what I said earlier, focusing on the individual experience. What, what is that user, how do, you know, what's the science of the eye, the science of the brain around how this works? How, how can you take advantage of that? What can you do in an experience that makes that work better? And then bring that back to the elements of the storytelling that you need to make, and, and you know, for, sometimes it's news, and sometimes it's it's documentary, and it's just it's it. it there are tremendous opportunities in documentaries and news around virtual reality, for example. It just it, if you've ever seen the, dem the, uh, the the virtual reality piece where you you um, are actually in, um, I think it was Sudan, and wandering around the the starving uh, f uh, families and the villages who, who really need the support. It could never be more personal to the individual to see that experience. It's not a flat screen, 30 second bite, um, you know, there's people starving in, in, in Sudan. Actually, to walk around and see that, it takes the news to a different level. It do really does, and I think the same for documentaries. Um, yeah, I'm, I, actually, I was, uh, uh, actually, she was saying that, I was thinking uh, there's a similar kind of thing with drones. We've, um, we've been doing a lot of stuff with drones and, and, and getting storytelling um, by, by, by being able to go places that you couldn't go uh, and get and get visuals and, and and you know an overview of what's happening in a different way. But but going back to the actual question, um, you know at CNN there's there's they're, they're, we're constantly trying to rethink how do we actually engage with consumer and how do we get content in their hands. Um, and one of the realizations that was made a while ago was that you can't always do it um, through through the same through the same brand. We actually launched a, a, just a few weeks ago a new new brand called uh, Great Big Story, which is. Um, a completely independent but wholly owned company that uh, is trying to um, take the stories that CNN doesn't really have. You know, honestly, it's like the, we'd like to be able to go into super in-depth on interesting stories, but it's kind of not our, our, our core brand. And so Great Big Story now is, is really trying to get interesting journalism and deliver it not in the traditional ways of, of putting it out, um, you know, on TV or, or on, on, a, on a website. They're actually creating content, mostly in video form, that will end up in your Facebook feed, or that will be tweeted. And that is their only delivery platform. They don't actually expect you to go to a website or an endpoint. They expect you to con just consume it as part of the other things that you do as you, know, as, as you live your life. So it's, I think that's an interesting um, way forward. And I, I like the way we've done that, because we just set up a, 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 a company that wasn't part of CNN and didn't really get an awful lot of support from them treated them like a startup and told them to just go and do it. And so if they fail, we can just, you know, write it off and walk away. But, yeah. but uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting approach. And finally, as the, uh, uh, it's a little weird as the nonprofit guy to put the business hat on, but one of the, uh, one of the things, I mean, this is tremendously important, um, but I always get a little nervous when, when uh, you know, we've got a lot of people who are high-minded and it's a great brand, so everyone in the world who has a new, uh, visualization, storytelling technology comes and they want to work with you. And it's great, right? And, and, but then you could be spending all of your time trying to reinvent storytelling and do all these amazing things. I, we were like this close to putting 10 people on a, on a Google Glass project where you sort of hike around and do a sort of immersive reality thing in national parks and it would have been super cool. But it's probably like maybe 10 years too early for that, that sort of technology. And you know we don't have 10 people to put on things that aren't gonna go anywhere. So it's a, it's a constant balance on, on these sorts of things. I mean, we have tremendous sort of appetite for these ideas, but the other is, you know, it's a tension on, you have these existing business models, you have these existing uh, cost structures, and that you sort of 
you know, we're all doing the, the, the dollar from your print world to your dime for your digital world to your penny for your mobile world. That's not a great progression for these large, stable companies. So we, we work with that stuff, but, uh, and, and we want to innovate. We have a lot of people. You know, we're one of the first people playing with 4K. We'll, be, we'll probably be one of the first people in smell o vision when that, you know, comes back. But, uh, you know, you're not necessarily going to build your whole business around mm -hmm. it. So we want to be, we, we do want to do that stuff. And unfortunately, I report to the CFO, so uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, we spend all the money. So, you know, you have to wear that hat, yeah. too. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And uh, I meaning going back to something basic, I, I saw you guys discussing. You know, there's the content owners, the technology, uh, the new generation of technology. I was going back to uh, some basic concepts. You know, uh, storytelling and story doing is back to when my granddad will tell a story, and the story will actually take a different. Uh, a, a different, uh, uh, it, w it will take a different ride, either if we were sitting on the far side, if there were kids of different ages. And uh, so it was not about the story. It was not about the setting. It was about the story, the setting, and the people that were participating and that interaction. So getting that vision in an integrated way, so developing a Google Glass without the story and trying to fit the story in, maybe, just maybe is not the right way to approach it, but going and thinking holistically, you know, with partnerships, with uh, the content, the technology, and uh, the human element, I think we can, we can make that story happen, and that's probably what the story doing is all about. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And, uh,